Hi everybody, my name is Mark Hayes, and today I'll be doing a breakdown of this stylized sand material. This was created entirely in Substance Designer, and the render you can see right now is on the Marmoset tool bag. Some of the different steps I'll be covering today are the sand pattern, adding the rocks and stones, creating and adding the non-organic objects such as the horseshoe and bullet casings, how I blend all these elements together using the height maps, I'll be showing you how I added the colour to the material, and finally I'll be going over the exposed parameters. With all that covered, let's jump into Designer and take a look at the graph. Okay, so in Substance Designer, I'm going to quickly turn on Tessellation first of all. So to do that, you go to Materials, Default, Definitions, PBR, and then choose Tessellation instead of Parallax Occlusion. And I'm just going to drag all of these sliders up to the max. Now you can see we have much more depth in our material, and we can kind of see what's happening a bit more clearly. So onto the actual graph itself, you can see I have everything colour coded and labelled so that I can come back in later and make adjustments and easily know where everything is. Doing this just makes it a lot simpler to come back later on if you wanted to add extra items, say if I wanted to add some more stones or something like that. This makes it very simple to find out where everything is and if you wanted to hand this over to somebody else, it'll make their life a lot easier trying to find their way through your graph. To create the sound pattern, I used a mix of the splatter note with warp and directional warp notes. This will give us that wavy pattern. So the way it works is that we take our polygon 2 note and plug it right into the splatter note. So using polygon 2 will give us a nice gradient to the edges. So we see here, and we go down to my splatter note, I've increased the pattern size width all the way up. This kind of blends all of the polygons together. So we start bringing that down, you'll see it turns back into the individual polygon two nodes. But by bringing it up, they all start blending together much better. I've brought the rotation all the way down to here, so we get this nice horizontal line. I didn't want, or sorry, a diagonal line. I didn't want horizontal lines going through the material. I thought it just, just looked a bit more interesting. To give it a bit of variation as well, I put the size variation all the way up. So we can see what this looks like, it does nothing, it becomes very uniform. We don't we don't want that in the sand. As well as I've also brought up the luminance variation. Doing this just gives us a bit more depth to the material. So we can see here if we bring it all the way down, it becomes a lot flatter. Whereas if we just give that a bit of variation, suddenly we get a much more interesting, a much more a much deeper sand to look at. So to get those wavy lines current, we still have all these being perfectly straight. We're going to plug these into a warp node and then use the Gaussian 1 node as our gradient input. Doing this, you can see its effect right here. So you can see where these little spots are. That's where these white dots are going from. Doing this just breaks it up and gives us a start on these wavy non-uniform lines. And so by using the directional warp node, we again we just enhance what we've done previously and make it even less uniform and less predictable. So I've, I've used a linear gradient with its tiling up a bit and then I've blurred it to just soften this out. So you can see what kind of effect it has if I start bringing this down just starts to skew it and gives what I think is a much more natural looking sound. One of the issues that you run into at this point is that this is all still very very sharp. So by blurring all of it, it softens all of these dunes down a bit, brings it all together, makes it more cohesive. And it also just makes it not like just makes it not nearly as sharp. The final thing I did to actually get the height of the sand is to add little grains into it. So if we zoom in, you can start to see these. So to do this, I've just used two black and white spots node, blended together with screen, which just gives us all these tiny little dots. And then I blend that with the blur node that we had previously. 
Now I've used overlay so it darkens to darks and brightens to brights, but I've set it to an incredibly low value of 0 0.02. That might seem a bit crazy, like it'd have almost no effect, but if we bring this down to zero, you can see how much of an effect it actually has. Let's bring that back. I just find that that is about as much as I want for my stylized material. I don't want it to be super busy on the surface. Like if I start bringing this up, you'll start to notice how quickly it gets overwhelmed and just becomes too noisy. Even though that's something like 0 0.7, it starts to fall more into like a gravelly type material. Especially for stylized material, I want it to appear a bit softer. So 0 0.02 is about as high as I want to go with that. So onto the stones, uh, as we're moving to the graph a bit more you're going to notice that a lot of the different notes throughout the rest of it is plugged into this one Perlin noise. The reason why I'm doing that and only using the one instead of having a Perlin noise coming out of each of these different nodes is that I want to keep this nice and efficient, if I'm bringing this into other softwares there's the chance that lots of noises will slow it down, they're quite computationally heavy. So by just using the one, it'll make things run a bit smoother in programs like Marmoset or in Substance Painter or whatever you want to use. But as for how I actually made the stones themselves, um, the first stone, which is the rounder one, is very, very simple. It's a polygon two node again, so we have that gradient. I've just brought up the sides from six to nine and brought up the curve a bit more just so it's a softer gradient and it's a bit smoother around the edges. I don't want to bring it up all the way I still want some of these planes to be visible so that they can be affected later on. I then just pass these through a level and a histogram range to flatten it out a little bit. If you leave it as it is at its base it'll end up being very very pointy. So this almost just rounds it off a bit and brings it down in the actual material itself. So if we zoom in here you can see what it looks like if we start playing with position of this gun range. You notice it starts dropping down into the sand. If we bring it up, it pokes up more. And all of this then is fed into this slope or grayscale. This is a node you're going to be seeing used a lot throughout this the rest of this video. Um, it's one of the reasons why I've the Perlin noise branched off so many times. So what we're doing with the slope or blur grayscale is we have our, we have it set to min What's happening is that we're taking chunks out of our shape and we're creating all of these individual little planes and all of this little detail that can be then utilized by both the color map later on and the height map to make the stones appear a bit more natural and a bit more roughed up. And the same thing is true for the second type of stone. This went through a slightly different process because I wanted a different shape. Uh, so we started off with a shape node with disc, I played with the size a bit just to get this elongated disc shape and then I plugged that into a warp node, again utilizing, utilizing this Perlin noise to break up this edge, make it more uneven. The next thing I do is I bring this into a bevel node. Now the reason for this is that when you're using tessellation and a height map, what can end up happening is that if you have this hard edge here you get distortion between the different levels of the grayscale. So if this was just white all the way around, I can actually show you. So if I just plug that in here, you start getting this awful distortion here. By beveling it before we do that, it softens the gradient and creates a smoother transition from whatever's below it to this stone. Next up, I'm just feeding it into a levels node so that we don't, so that we aren't hitting that pure white value anymore. I want to be working off grays at this point. I don't want to be maxing out the possible height information that I can have. The next part here is where I use my this linear gradient. This is to create the angle effect. So by 
overlaying a linear gradient top using multiply. It creates this slope so it looks like the sand is the uh, stone is poking into the sand or coming out from it and just gives it a bit more a bit more detail compared to the round one and it gives a bit of variation to the material throughout. So you can see there's points where it's only barely poking out or there's ones where it's almost completely out. Next we have another slope or grayscale. So this is using the same perlin noise. I've just used a transform 2D node to rotate the perlin noise a little bit. This is because when we used our warp node earlier with the same perlin noise you ended up just, it almost just enhanced what the warp was doing and by rotating it we get a bit more random effect. So again we're creating all of these new planes to give a bit of interest throughout the stone itself. Finally, plugging that into a levels node just to bring it up a little more. So I was a bit heavy handed with the previous grades but that allowed us to get all of this detail in the slope blur. Bringing into levels and bringing all those grade values up just a bit. It also brings out some of these really deep things that the slope blur did. So if we look in here and in here, you can see that it's gone very, very dark and I'm worried, I was worried about these distorting if I was using tessellation. So by putting it into a levels node, it just softens this out again. When it comes to actually scattering them around the sand, what I've used is I've used the tile sampler. So you can see here the X and Y amount are set to be exposed and I'll cover that at the end of the video. Uh, but for the pattern, I've set the pattern input to two so that I can include both of the different types of stones. And then I've just randomized a couple of the different options here. You can see here I've got the scale random set up. I've got some random rotation as well. So by setting all these values, it just starts breaking this up a bit and making it look like they're not placed in any sort of ordered fashion. The most important part about this though is using the mask random. Uh, this is again exposed, but this is what creates this random distribution of them. I'll cover again that later on when I'm exposing the parameters but just keep in mind at this point that that's going to be something very important. Next up we have the non-organics. So that's going to be the bullets and the horseshoes. For this, it really just boils down to trying to build up the form slowly using smaller shapes. So in the horseshoe, you can see my progress here as I go from circles into semicircles, and then eventually all the way down to the finished horseshoe. There's a couple of things that make your life a lot easier as you're doing this. So the first I'd say is to turn off tiling and a lot of these transformation nodes. So you can see here that if I go to the tiling mode, normally this is set to relative to parent. And you can see that is not what I'm going to be looking for at all. By just clicking here, setting it to absolute and turning this to no tiling. suddenly it's much easier to manipulate this shape. And if I click into our blend node, I can then move this around to wherever I want and start taking it out of the shape here. And I do that using a blend node, using subtract. So if I'm looking to take anything away, I just use subtract. In this case here, I'm trying to add on, I'll use linear dodge or add. Um, the other really important thing when you're using these transformation nodes and trying to build up using smaller shapes is that you can see here I've got two transformation nodes inputted into a blend. So in this case, I, this was going to be mirrored, so I wanted these to be in the exact same position on either side, but I only wanted to control one of them because I just I find it much easier if I'm controlling a smaller shape. So by taking one of these transformation nodes, plugging it into a second one, and then setting horizontal mirror. So by just clicking this, you can see it flips over and back. Suddenly, if I look at our blend node down here, I click on our transformation node and I start dragging this around. It's perfectly mirrored. That makes making adjustments 
doing some fine tuning and some last minute tweaks very very easy so you can see it just it's a lot cleaner way of doing it and it makes your own life a bit easier makes stuff simpler after this it goes through the same process of beveling and then using a levels node as we did previously with the stones uh, just to bring down those white levels give it a softer edge from here I wanted to add some little holes to break up the very plain shape here uh, to do that I just used a splatter circular node so this creates a ring of of, an, a, of a pattern I've used bell as our pattern input so this gives us a bit of a gradient so it's not a very stark contrast between the two being cut into here so we've got a little bit of a gradient to make it a bit softer I've then given it a little bit of random scale so you can see here scale randoms up a bit that just again gives a bit of variation throughout the material I've then fed it into a transformation 2d node this is using the same values as I did back here just so I'm sure it fits perfectly into these then feeding it into a blend node with subtract now one thing I did is because I didn't want the holes to go all the way up to the tip of the horseshoe I've just reused this blend node where we have the semicircle shape and I've plugged it into the mask to just make sure it doesn't affect these areas here after this we go through the same process of using slope alert grayscale to start chipping away on it I've done one thing slightly differently then I've used a blend node with multiply again same pearl and noise that we've been using this whole time using multiply instead of just increasing the value of the slope blur means that we are darkening down these chips a bit but it's not warping the shape of our horseshoe I wanted to keep this general shape I just wanted to give a bit of surface noise to it and create a, some deeper dents into what's already there when it comes to actually tiling this across the material and placing it in different places in the sand I've used tile generator in this case so what I've done with the tile generator is I've just set the X and Y input to 6 so that just happened to be the shape or this made the size of the horseshoes that I was looking for personally I've set the pattern input distribution to random so it'll just if I wanted to add more things to this tile generator it would randomly distribute them around I've set up the rotation random to full I've also set the luminance random up a bit this just means that you can see here this is significantly brighter than over here it'll put them at different levels on the height map so you can see this one's a bit higher than the one over here Finally, I've set the random mask to be once again used by an exposed parameter. This one's very important, and I'll actually I'll just cover a little bit of that now. I will cover it again later. Because I've got a second tile generator here, and they're both feeding into the one blend node. So what this is doing with the linear gradient feeding into the tile genera generator, it's using all the same settings. But what's happening with this is that when I using multiplying the blend node I'm creating this gradient here and by setting a different C to the random rotation it'll put different sides of the horseshoe down in different areas so if we look on this side here the left hand side is being pushed into sand whereas here it's the back this just creates a bit more visual interest than having them sitting flat on top of the sand or having them all Go, be pushed into the sand at the same direction the bullets in comparison now are a bit simpler they're just using a rectangular shape uh, with a linear gradient using darken overlaid on top this will start rounding it off a bit instead of it being just a flat shape uh, one thing I've done after this after adding the linear gradient is to feed it through a curve node so what this is doing here is it's bringing the white value down a little bit and just softening that gradient a bit we want this to be round but if we just plug this blend node straight up into the next blend node ignoring the curve you'll see it becomes a lot sharper and not what we're looking for by using that curve node we get this nice round shape 
creating this little bevel just past where the firing pin would be it's very simple we've just used another shape use transform with again no tiling we've brought it down to where we want it and we've put a bevel on it again just soften those transitions a bit and then we've blended it on top using subtract just to start darkening in this area just a little bit you'd be surprised how much effect especially at this scale it has like you can see here it's gone down quite a bit even though it doesn't look like it up here after this we fed it into two different slope blur grayscales uh, the reason for this is here is what I wanted it to affect the height of the material but later on when I was doing the color mapping I found that I wanted a bit more detail but when I tried increasing the slope blurs intensity I found it was too harsh for the um, for the height map so I just I ended up going with two so that I can utilize that in the gradient map and I can use this when actually affecting the height Blending all the height maps together is really where some of the organization I did earlier starts to come into play. So if we go down here and have a look at my height blend section, you can see I've used the red frame, the, the same red frames that I used on the uh, sand to represent the overall height blend. That's because the sand was the base for all of these different nodes. I'm blending things into the sand, so I want that to be clear from the frame out here. But what I've done inside of this is I've added extra frames, so you can see here I've used the teal from the stones, the gold from the bullets, and the purple from the horseshoes. This lets me see at a glance which node is for which. I don't have to look into them, I don't have to try and remember which one's which, I don't need to follow these lines up to the other nodes. I can just check at a glance. The node I'm using to blend all these materials together is the height blend node. So if I click into that you can see some of the details of it. So you can see here I've got the height offset. So what this does is it actually changes the amount that the stones will be pushing through the sand. So if I bring this down, you'll start to see them disappear and push further into the sand. If I bring this all the way up, you'll start to see them poke out more. If we bring it up again, we're going to see something that's an issue I started to run into, or something I noticed at least, is that if you start pushing the height blend too far, you'll lose detail in the underlying map so in this case it's sand i mean it makes sense because it's trying to you can't increase the stones past white so it has to darken what's below it to try and give you the effect of them pushing through further but it is something to try to keep in mind when using this node is that you just need to be a bit careful about how you use it and try to preserve the detail in your underlying maps the reason that I chose to use these anyway and worked with the different values in it is that it gives me this height mask output so you can see here it's showing you what is outputting and gives you a nice crisp mask of it so if I want to use this somewhere else so for instance I've used it on my metallic map I've taken the height mask out of both the horseshoes and the bullets and I've blended those together and those act as my entire metallic map. It's really clean, it's a really easy way of using them. I've also then used them to work on the colour. So by using this it's a, again a really simple way of showing where the colour should be on the on the material. So here you can see I'm using this this map here, using that to blend the stones on, here's the bullets, See the bullets that are the only ones getting the colour, and then again the same with the horseshoes. When it came to adding colour, I really tried to let the height maps do most of the work, but for the actual gradient maps themselves, which I've used to add colour to the different elements, I tried to keep all of the gradients very, very soft. Um, so if we take a look here for uh, the stones for example, I'm using the output from the tile sampler, plugging that straight into a gradient map, and here I've actually just left it stock. I wanted my stones to be grey. Well, if we zoom in here we can see 
we still have a lot of nice detail in the color itself so we've got these nice edges up here followed by a shadow same thing all the way down I found when working with stylized materials or even when working in non stylized things if you exaggerate the highlights a bit it will come out stylized so that's something I've tried to emulate here so even if we look at the gradient map itself we can see all of these little ridges creating different planes and creating highlights throughout for the bullets we mentioned earlier that I had two slope blurs here so for the height itself I didn't want that big of a details in the bullet casings I wanted them to just be a little dense but for the gradient map and the color I wanted it to be a bit more exaggerated so that's what the second slope blur up here is for I've gotten all these really harsh edges I've created this much more visual interest so that when I go to add the gradient map you can see here I've still gone with a pretty soft gradient it just gradually changes color over time but if we zoom in you'll start to see all these dents really come to life so you can see here at the top highlight you can see how it just skirts around some softer bits just creates a bit more visual interest and you can see it here on the material itself how that little dent is just exaggerated a bit more because of this color map for the sand uh, things take a little bit of a turn but not too far so again we start off with our soft gradient map I've used a HSL afterwards to give me a bit of control on changing the saturation and the lightness just makes it easier than going back and changing these individual little points uh, I can just control it as a whole here but what you see up on top here this is used with our exposed parameters what this is is it lets me in substance painter or marmoset or wherever I want to export this material to it allows me to adjust the highlight that goes on top so if we just follow this note back we can see it comes out before we added the great little individual grains of sand so all of this little detail and this surface noise isn't going to be uh, visible on this map so we've gone out from the one before here into a normal note and this is just going to start bringing out the ridges on top plunging down into curvature so we get in black and white pushing it through a blur to soften it a bit and then leveled in a histogram scan to give us these really sharp highlights so this is the top ridges on all of the um, the sand dunes what we do with this is we plug into a contrast luminosity node now you can see here that both of these are exposed parameters so if I click and I go down and I look at my parameters I can see I have two things here I've got sand highlight contrast and sand highlight luminosity so what this gives me is it gives me the ability to exaggerate this highlight on top right now it seems okay even with without this highlight on at all but if we just start pushing this value up a bit you'll start to see it just starts picking these highlights out So I wanted that level of control in other software, which is why it's exposed. But I just found this is a nice, it's a nice, and it actually doesn't take that long to set up. It's a nice way of getting these highlights in and giving you a bit more control in other programs. When it comes to blending all of these different color maps together, I've just used blend nodes, and then I've utilized, as I said earlier, the height mask output from the height blend nodes. That just makes it very, very simple to blend all these together I put the sand in the background I put the mask in the opacity mask in the opacity uh, input and then I take the color from each of them so the stones goes to the stones input again you can see my frames here showing you which blend node is for which so teal that's the stones and if we follow it up then you can see it as well so that's going in there with the mask from the height blend for the stones same thing with the bullets so you can see the bullets here taking from the color map up here and the same with the horseshoes taking from the color map here and all of that is just then plugged straight into our input when it comes to exposed parameters you want to be thinking about the different ways you could use the material 
So for me, I wanted to be able to use this material in a uh, shooting gallery style environment. So the ability to add lots of these bullet casings was really important. To do that, I exposed one of the parameters. So you can see over here, I've got a bullets bullet mask. So if I start bringing that down, I'm gonna see lots and lots of bullets start appearing on it. And the way that works is that if I have a look at the tile generator over here under the bullets, and I scroll down, this is random mask. You can go down here and click on this little icon. And suddenly you've got all these options. So this is where if you didn't have it exposed, you'd get the option to expose. Otherwise you can just assign it a property. So for me, I have the bullets mask property here. So I can just assign that. And suddenly it's assigned to everything. Now, one of the issues with having two child generators is, is that if this changes, this doesn't necessarily change either, which would throw off the color map in this instance. So what I've done is I've actually set this to be the same value. So I can go down here and go to bullets mask. I set it to that. It sets it to the same value. Another thing I want to be able to do is change the amount of stones that are visible. So I've done the same thing with the mask. So again, if I go over here, I can bring down this mask value and suddenly there's way more stones. But I just wanted to be able to change the total number of stones. So this is just hiding and showing some of the stones. I want to be actually to change the amount of them. So we have a look at the tile sampler for the stones. We can see up here, I've got two different values. I've got the X amount and I've got the Y amount. Now, if I expose one of these, I ran into issues trying to assign it to the previous one. So what I did was I double clicked and I just add a new parameter out here. And this needs to be an integer. I can give this a, I can give this a name and call it stones stones number. I could go back to the tile sampler and then I could change this x amount from stones amount to stones number and change the y amount from stones amount to stones number. And suddenly I've got control of the stones now using this new parameter. So if I change this, I bring this up all the way. You start to see them change the amount of them. Now I've already got one of these set up called stones amount, which does this for me. So you can set the default, the min and the max values here. You can just play around with these numbers to find what's right for you. So let's set this back. Stones, stones amount, stones, stones amount. Uh, finally, I wanted to be able to adjust the actual look of the sand itself. So I want to be able to change the sand pattern dynamically in whatever I was, whatever program I was using. So to do that, I go all the way back to the splash note, right back to the very beginning. And I looked at this value, the grid number. So that's the number of these polygon two nodes that are displayed across here. So by tying that to an exposed parameter, if I go to sand type and I start changing this, you notice the entire sand pattern completely changes and suddenly we have something new. Now when combining this parameter here, with the highlight that we looked at earlier in our color section, this becomes much more powerful. So if we start cranking that highlight up, we're gonna start getting those edges. And then we have a completely different looking material. Let's change that back to three. So with all that covered, I think we've come to the end of this breakdown. Uh, thank you all so much for watching, if you made it this far. Um, I hope you learned something and I hope you enjoyed it. Uh, if you have any questions, feel free to put them in the comments below. Or feel free to send me a message directly at uh, on um, ArtStation at artstation.com slash mark t underscore h. Uh, thanks for watching.